This magical tale about the power of storytelling and faith has so many messages that, like the never-ending story itself, are timeless. Let's hop on Falcor and explore. This is the ending of the never-ending story, finally explained. The never-ending story takes the tried-and-true formula of the hero's journey and gives it an interesting narrative twist by doubling up on protagonists. Atreyu is tasked with finding a cure for the childlike empress whose deathly illness threatens the fabric of Fantasia, while a dark force called the Nothing eats everything in its path. From the ivory tower to the swamps of sadness, the southern oracle and the ends of Fantasia itself, Atreyu searches for a cure at great personal loss. He loses his horse and his best friend Artax, which threatens the courage and resolve that got him on this journey in the first place. Fortunately, he makes a new friend in Luck Dragon Falcor, who helps him get back on track. At the first gate of the Southern Oracle, Atreyu faces another test. This time, he must confront his own sense of self-worth, proving he believes in himself. He then has to confront the vision of his true self in a mousy little boy named Bastion, who is reading a book far, far away. Part of Atreyu's journey is complete when he learns the childlike empress needs a new name, and only a human child can bestow it. But there are more setbacks in store. Atreyu loses Falcor and his magical talisman and is forced to confront the Nothing's minion with nothing but his own wits and strength. Meanwhile, Bastion has his own part to play in the never-ending story. At first, it seems like a simple framing sequence, with Bastion reading a storybook about the events unfolding for Atreyu and Fantasia. He's grieving the loss of a mother who seemed to support her son's sensitivity and daydreaming, and his escape into flights of fancy are his coping method. When Atreyu loses Artax, Bastion weeps along with him, because he has felt that loss himself. My horse died. I nearly drowned. I just barely got away from the nothing. As he reads, Bastion realizes that he might be the most important hero of them all. And to honor his cherished mother and her memory, he even gives her name to the childlike empress, saving her and Fantasia. If it seems silly that a new name might save someone's life, then you haven't considered the power of what we call things. Bastion is called terrible names by the school bullies, which certainly affects how he feels and sees himself. With the arrival of the Nothing, the childlike empress also loses an aspect of herself that must be reinvented. Her new name is a new start, not just for the empress, but for her whole world. As Bastion makes his wishes, he ensures that all the friendships made before the Nothing's rampage remained intact. He ultimately gets to experience a ride on Falcor firsthand, and even gives his bullies a taste of their own terrible medicine. As the Nothing sweeps across Fantasia, a ragtag bunch meets in the Howling Forest on their way to the Ivory Tower. The Rockbiter, the Night Hob and his stupid bat, as well as Teeny Weeny and his racing snail. They are all members of different Fantasian groups with the same mission of beseeching the childlike empress for help restoring their lands. This unlikely group quickly becomes friends as they realize how each can help the others. The Night Hob is able to fly to the top of the ivory tower and hear the news. The Rockbiter offers all the little ones protection. And the Racing Snail is here to shatter preconceived notions of what certain kinds of creatures can do. What bonds them is the shared loss of their ancestral lands through the power of dark forces, which brings a theme of colonization into the never-ending story's mix and leads to a very grim moment when the Nothing snatches the Rockbiter's friends right from under him. They look like big, good, strong hands, don't they? The Rockbiter gives up hope and allows the Nothing to take him, but because of Bastion's clever wishes, he and his comrades are eventually reunited and continued their shared friendship through the collective trauma they all survived. One of the most satisfying things about a fairy tale like The NeverEnding Story is how far into destruction we travel before the world is restored to rights. The Nothing destroys all of Fantasia except for a single grain of sand before Bastion heals the Empress with her new name. The forces of darkness are defeated, but there is still work to do to properly restore all that's been damaged. Bastion has a huge job ahead of him now that he's no longer just an armchair hero. And when the Empress grants Bastion all the wishes he needs to recreate Fantasia, it's a victory against hopelessness. 
When we see Fantasia rebuilt in a new form of glory, it reminds us that maintaining hope in even the bleakest of circumstances is a life-affirming act, and one we should strive to cultivate as Bastion does. Falcor might be the single most beloved character in the never-ending story. Between his hearty chuckle and his friendly canine features, Falcor is a reminder that we must always fight against the kind of hopelessness embodied by the nothing. While many times luck is actually a product of good circumstances, timing, and privilege, the luck symbolized by Falcor is about the faith that goodness and good people will ultimately prevail. Even when Atreyu is convinced that he failed to find the human child who could give the Empress a new name, Falcor comforts him and reminds him that he did his very best. And that kind reminder is what draws viewers to the Luck Dragon. In a scene that has been traumatizing children alike for decades, Atreyu loses his beloved horse in the swamps of sadness. Even today, people who have seen the never-ending story a hundred times know it is the most brutal scene in the film, and some will even leave the room to avoid shedding tears. Looking at the big picture, though, the terrible events in the swamps of sadness are a perfect metaphor for grief, loss, and childhood trauma. This is probably why adults still have a visceral reaction to the incident even years later because we remember being Atreyu's age and having to navigate our own losses in different ways. What ends up being beautiful about this painful scene is how it shows us that even a warrior isn't immune to grief. For Bastion, the moment allows him to feel his own grief and begin to process the trauma of losing his mother and teaches him one of the movie's lessons. It has to hurt if it's to heal. Avoidance doesn't make wounds go away, and pain has the power to remind us we are still alive and healing. Sometimes people become more cynical as they get older, and this can quickly turn into bitterness and resentment. It certainly does with Bastion's father, who is all business and can't understand why his son can't move on from his mother's death as quickly. He sees Bastion's sensitivity as weakness, and so does the nothing. Because people who have no hopes are easy to control. This is a scarily true statement in our own human world, where every day people lose hope and turn to all kinds of ways not to care about others. Morla the Ancient One embodies this despair, constantly saying that nothing matters, echoing the apathy and cynicism that we often see in adults. Atreyu and Bastion, however, both refuse to accept these supposedly grown-up truths. One of the never-ending story's most important messages is having faith in the competence of children. Just because someone is young doesn't make them incapable of great feats. He simply can't imagine that one little boy could be that important. Sadly, Bastion has been bullied for the traits that make him the ideal child to help save Fantasia, so he has no idea how much power he holds in his heart and imagination. When he learns his own strength, though, it's a lesson he'll hopefully never forget. The never-ending story is packed full of important themes and messages, but one of the most fundamental is about the dangers of bullying, including the way that parents treat their children. The bullying that Bastion deals with from his classmates is awful and humiliating, but the quiet bullying he endures from his father is far more insidious than being tossed into a dumpster by his classmates. He berates his son for his keen imagination and the way he expresses himself in ways that are all healthy coping mechanisms for a child grieving the recent loss of his mother. This is one of the more painful aspects of the film, and explains why Bastion wouldn't want to come back to Earth so quickly once he finally visits Fantasia. Many kids who are sensitive and imaginative find sanctuary in books and stories on their best days. On a bad day, however, like the one that sees Bastion bullied by both his father and the regular trio of tormentors at school, a book is an even more valuable tool of escape. He simply cannot deal with the real world, and the only thing that makes sense to him is digging into a book he's never read before. There's an almost religious kind of sanctuary in the way the film presents the act of reading, and there's more to it than just escapism. As the bookseller Mr. Coriander says, a safe book allows you to return to yourself unscathed by the end. But a dangerous book will change you, and fundamentally change how you see and experience the world. The never-ending story also introduces young audiences to the notion of metatextuality, stories within stories. Just as he is sharing all your adventures, others are sharing his. This narrative trick can draw readers and viewers even deeper into a story by making us a part of it, 
and that's a huge reason why The NeverEnding Story still resonates with audiences today. As a film, The NeverEnding Story focuses on adapting the first half of Mikhail Enda's beautiful book about how a little boy saves the world through reading. The NeverEnding Story 2, the next chapter, was released in 1990 with an entirely new cast, except for grouchy bookstore owner Carl Conrad Coriander. In this sequel, Bastion is trying to get over his fear of heights, which he does not have when he's riding on the back of a luck dragon. When the Orin, the mystical talisman carried by Atreyu, calls to him, he returns to Fantasia where a new evil, the Emptiness, is being fueled by a sorceress. She tricks Bastion into making wishes, all the while stealing his memories of Earth and home. 1994's The NeverEnding Story 3 diverges completely from Enda's book and returns with yet another new cast. This time Bastion battles The Nasty, played by Jack Black in one of his first major roles, and reunites with many characters from the original film. When Atreyu reaches the boundaries of Fantasia, he finds a temple in ruins with elaborate paintings. He's shocked to see the paintings are of him and everything he survived. The never-ending story suggests that Atreyu's journey, like the classic hero's journey structure that it follows, has happened many times before and will probably happen again. The cycle of life and destruction and life emerging again is, in fact, a never-ending story. But more than that, the fight against apathy and hopelessness and replacing them with hope and faith is a story without an ending, too. Like the symbol of two snakes entwined eating their own tails, these important themes from the story continue to be relevant in the human world. The fact that after so many decades, people still watch, engage with, and adore the never-ending story is simply a testament to the everlasting power of this triumphant tale. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite stuff coming soon! Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one!